Hello and welcome to this week's episode of In The Bunch, the world's fastest moving cycling magazine show. Cycling season in South Africa a bit strange at the moment. The roadies have just come to the end of their season, the mountain bikers dusting off their bikes. Of course at world level the European One Day Classics are plenty at the moment as we lead into the big tours. In this week's episode Phil Ligger joins us from his African home which is in Palabora on the Willy Fans Road at a little place called Griki, magnificent setting that Phil has there. But Velo News recently ran a whole poll to determine the world's most valuable rider. Names like Froome, Valverde, Van Avermaet, Sagan came up in this uh, whole poll. Sagan of course tops, but we chat to Phil about his thoughts on that score. It's a very interesting question. There's no doubt that the Velo News survey has named the current crop of best riders in the world of cycling. And probably the most, not just with the legs, but also with the personalities and the persona. Now, Peter Sagan, after the Tour of Flanders, became the world number one cyclist, as well as being, uh, for the third year, the world road race champion. So he's very definitely at the top. But he's most necessary, not because uh, he's the world champion, but because he's such an entertaining bike rider. The public want to see him, and the sport desperately needs right now an icon like Sagan. On occasions I've interviewed him or spoken to him privately, he's never, ever said, I can't be bothered now, I'm in a hurry stop yes let's talk what's the problem i've asked him for autographs for young children away from the country i've been in no problem give me the hat give me the jersey sign it he's just a, a genuine guy that people can attach to i have a lot of admiration too for alejandro valverde because of that terrible crash last year in the tour de france uh, i thought his career was finished yet he's having the most amazing start to the year i think as we speak he's had eight victories and he's a man in my book who has fought his way back. And as his management team said only the other day, if Alejandro wants to do it, he'll do it. You can't say he's a man to win the Tour de France, he's a man to win a one-day classic. He decides what he wants to do, and he goes out and he tries to win it, whatever the type of bike race. So they're the best names, and yes, we very much need them right now because of the, the problems that we've got within the sport, which we've had for many years, let's face it. Well, Velo News certainly got it right, according to Phil Liggett, that Peter Sagan topping the pops on that occasion, but he failed in the recent run of Flandre. Desperate attempt at an attack right near the end, but those legs were jelly, like most legs would be after about 250 kilometers of Cobble Classic. World's biggest single-day bike race saw a great result in the women's event for South Africa's Ashley Moorman Passio. This much separating her from the third place and Anna Mick van Vleuten just, just ousting her on that occasion. Bodes particularly well for the Commonwealth Games though, but we chatted to Ashley after the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Yeah, I was quite convinced I was going to finish third and then literally in the last centimetres Anna Mick van Vleuten just managed to pip me and to take third on the line. Innsbruck in Austria, when you stop there, you close your eyes and you can smell that wonderful coffee smell. You see the ski ramp from the Winter Olympics and it's a beautiful ski holiday destination. But for a World Road Race Championship in September this year, the man who was also in the top five, in fact, Vincenzo Nibali, the Italian star winner of Milano Sanremo and the Giro di Lombardi at the end of last year, went to reconnoitre the course and left shocked. Now he's a climber. Has this course, in fact, been designed in Austria to deny Peter Sagan an unprecedented fourth victory in the World Road Race Championship? And if so, is this the opportunity of Alejandro Valverde to finally win the Arcon C or the Rainbow Jersey? No better than Phil Liggett lounging, of course, on the deck in Griki to give us his thoughts on this one. Like a world championship, you measure your effort a lot different to riding a straight A to B stage of the Tour de France. So we must never discount Peter Sagan. I'm sure he won't discount himself. But if Nibali says it's a very hard course, and I have seen those quotes saying just that, uh, then it must be very hard because Nibali we do talk of as being a good climber and a very good all-round stage race rider. You know, there's a big difference between stage race riding and one-day riding. You ride a different bike race. Um, it might well turn out to be the toughest in the history of the World Championships, but I doubt it. We've had some good races. Well, I remember 1980 in Solange when Bernard Eno won there. That was a brute of a course with a major climb of around eight kilometers every lap. And it was simply a wall of attrition. Eventually, one by one, the riders dropped away until on the last lap, Eno was on his own 
and he won the world title in France, which was great for him. And it was after he'd abandoned the Tour de France that year as well, when he was the defending champion. So it all worked out for him. No, I think it, Valverde is would start favourite on his current form, and we're still months from the world title. Valverde would start as my favourite to win. It sounds like a cause to suit him. And speaking of Alejandro Valverde, he has six World Championship medals and still not a gold. Makes him all-time record holder as far as medals go. His build-up's in great, great nick at the moment. They're winning the recent Tour of Catalonia, which was held in atrocious conditions. A six-day tour, which saw South Africa's Willie Smith back on two wheels after breaking his collarbone. And these are a tough bunch when you listen to Willie's comments after this race. Your conf <laughs> confidence is really not good. Um, yes, it was my first race back since the, the, the collarbone that, that I broke. So you, going down mountains at 100 to 110 kilometers per hour around sketchy uh, corners with a little bit of uh, snow um, next to the road, you, you are a bit scared. And then obviously every bump I could feel uh, the plate pushing against my bone and skin and it's, it was really uncomfortable. And if you thought you wanted to be a professional cyclist, listen to Ryan Gibbons after the recent Ghent Vierville game. I, again, you know, I've had a really unlucky season so far. I've had punctures and crashes yesterday. And I was always kind of on the back foot, always chasing back. Um, had a puncture after about 180 Ks. Had to try and chase back and was towards the back when it split and got back again. And then I'm trying to move up on the right-hand side and I crashed and had to have a bike change and then chased back again in a crucial moment. So all that being said, I think I'm, you know, I'm chuffed to have finished and in the second or third group or whatever it was, but, but very frustrated. And sticking with the tough stuff, a brilliant ride from Brennan Davids in the Tour of Langkawi, one of Southeast Asia's biggest bike races, and stage seven always is a stinger, but he thought this was particularly so. It was quite an aggressive tour too, particularly, um, I'd say, stage seven. Uh, stage seven was arguably the hardest day I've ever had on a bike and speaking to some of the world tour riders said they hadn't even had days like that where where we'd we'd been not so on it for the entire stage so um yeah like I said it's it's it was definitely a big eye opener Topping the cake though, the cherry on top of it all, Stier van der Bob, the recent winner of the Tour of Good Open, he's won it twice now, came up trumps in one of the world's biggest under 23 bike races in Italy, the Gran Premio Palio della Ricciotto, which is 57 years old, and boy was that victory salute if he's not a sweet one, absolutely magnificent. Right, time to go mountain biking now, some off-road action and the second leg of the South African Mountain Bike Cross Country Cup took the riders to Tarba Trails, where Alan Heatherley made a wonderful return after fracturing his wrist before the World Cup to win the men's version. I had a good start. I sort of made it hard for myself by going almost too hard on the first two laps to try um, simulate uh, international World Cup or obviously something similar like Commonwealth Games. I mean, it worked quite well for me. And Mariska Strauss doing exactly the same in the ladies' category. I um, really didn't know what to expect being sick um, at Epic. And then I kind of just... The uh, race played out quite well. Kind of started um, at my own pace. I rode on Thursday, so I really didn't know what the legs would be like on Saturday. They just tried to, to get into the swing of things. And yeah, then took the win. And if you really thought you wanted to be a professional cyclist, listen to this one. The Cape Epic, the world's biggest mountain bike race. The leading South African pair, Philip Bass, Matthijs Birkes, finds Philip Bass ill on the night before the race. Julian Jessup, a young rider, is equally sick. He's in fact just completing his last antibiotic when he gets a phone call to partner Matthijs Birkes, the strongest man arguably on South Africa's marathon circuit. And it's amazing that young Julian managed to actually survive this to tell us this tale. Philip and I actually went to the doctor at the same time. Philip was more sick than me, but I was on a, put on an antibiotic course and actually ended it um, the, the night before the prologue. So I ended my antibiotic course the night before the prologue. And then the whole state race, I kind of battled with, with uh, congestion in my nose. Um, when Ron spoke to me, Ron's our team manager, about riding with Matthijs, uh, I was both like really excited, like flip, this could be awesome, but I was also nerve-wrackingly scared. Like, uh, Mendes is so strong, uh, he's probably in the 
one of the strongest, if not the strongest marathon rider in South Africa at the moment. Well, a big win there for the young Julian Jessup and his senior partner Matthijs Bierkes in the best African team competition in the Cape Epic. The overall title going to the Czech rider Yaroslav Kulavi, the ex-Olympic Games champion and Howard Grotz from the USA. The women's title going to Candice Lowell and Amy McDougall, herself touched by a little bit of illness in and around this massive event. It was hard. It took everything mentally and physically. Um, I had to just think of the bigger picture. I had to think, you know, the stomach bug's not going to last the entire race. I have to. We had won the African jersey on the very first day, so I knew if I just pushed through, we could carry on defending the, the jersey. But yeah, to get up, especially on the second and third day after being up all night with the bug, was it was hard. And a big sprint has ensued here yeah, with uh, the lead out coming now for Reynard Butler who's got a commanding lead, he's five, six bikes ahead of second place, it looks like Ryan Harris getting for second there, he's going to do it and ooh, Clint Hendricks very, very close to our camera but he's in third, a great result there for Reynard Butler. Well, that victory in the Emperor's Palace Classic there was win number three on the classic season of 2018 for Reynard Butler sprinting to victory on that occasion. Women's race saw back-to-back -back victory for the defending champion Kim Lacourt, the Mauritian National Road Race champ. Sprinted in a group of men that had caught them from behind to unfortunately hide most of the women. And hidden behind her was the girl that caught our eye. She of the James Bond leading lady name, Tiffany Keep. Ding, 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 ding. Well, she's destined to be a peloton leading lady, no doubt. She got second, that's Tiffany, on this occasion in the elite women's race on those restricted junior gears of 52 times 14. Great result from her. And I spotted Kim Lacourt, who is a renowned sprinter in South Africa, and I decided to stick by her for as long as possible because I knew she would time it correctly as she really wanted to win this race and defend her title. Um, I stuck behind her. Carla Oberholzer was leading her out and there was one other lady in front of her. And as soon as she opened up her sprints, I just basically gave it my all. Um, I had no idea where I was coming because there were men all around and um, they were getting caught up in our sprint. So when I eventually crossed the line and realized I'd come second overall, I was really overwhelmed, overwhelmed and it was exciting. <laughs> My gear is not as great as them so when it gets to flat sections and long downhills I spin out much more easily than the elite so I really have to make sure I'm in a good position to draft some of the other riders because I can't compete with them on the high speed downhills as I can't pedal nearly as fast. You might recall in our previous episode, we questioned the use in sport and cycling in particular of therapeutic use exemptions, where you get a prescription to take a prohibited substance so that you can manage to participate in the sport. Well, Chris Froome, the Tour de France multiple victor, been racing under a cloud since the Vuelta a España of last year, where he was caught in the deciding stage for the overuse of this. We caught up with Phil Liggett for the last time on his magnificent patio there on the Olifants River, and these are his thoughts on that delicate score. Yeah, the problem with TUEs is I think they're past their sell-by date. At the time, it seemed to be a legal way uh, to allow a sick cyclist, for example, who's suffering from asthma, quite legally so, continue his sport. Now, the treatment for asthma, I believe and understand, is not taking drugs. It is simply clearing the airwaves to allow you to participate. It's like allowing you to continue working in the office by taking an aspirin to stop the headache. It's not making you perform any better. It's putting you on the same starting line alongside the other cyclists. Uh, but I think they pushed it to the limits. They've abused it. And by they, I mean the cyclists. Um, Team Sky has admitted uh, overuse, I think, of TUEs. And uh, therefore, the, as a, in our climate that we're in now, people see the performances of riders on Team Sky and they're not being caught for taking drugs, so they're pointing fingers. Uh, team Sky is not a popular team, whether we like to think it or not, sadly, uh, because they've achieved so much for British cycling. Uh, and so they're making enemies within the press, and the press are out to get them. This does seem to be the case. Um, in the case of Chris Froome, oh, this guy we know has had asthma. He's had it all of his life. And I've known Chris uh, since he was a young cyclist uh, racing here in South Africa for Conica Minolta. <laughs> Uh, I don't believe that guy's a cheat, um, but the finger of suspicion is there. It's under the clouds of Team Sky. He's a part of Team Sky. Now, on the fact whether he should have continued to race till the matter was cleared up, I believe he, he had to make the decision. He's a, he's a professional cyclist. He wants to do his job. He's not being accused of taking 
performance enhancing drugs. That's never an issue. But it's a question if he's had an overdose of salbutamol, what does it do? And you can ask two experts and neither will give you the same answer because nobody actually knows whether it's affected his performance or not. So all that's at stake is to prove, did he take above the allowed limit within the 24 hours of taking that drug, uh, that uh, overdose? And if he did, then he probably will be suspended. But they have a choice whether they disqualify him from events gone by or events that he might ride right now. It's a very, very uh, difficult position, and I wouldn't like to be in Chris's uh, shoes right now. Um, but if he does win these big races, I see the side of the organizers too. In comes the world body and suspends him and, and disqualifies him from any prizes won since uh, he won the uh, uh, Tour of Spain last year, which means that they've got no winners on the books for this year, and they've already got the embarrassment of seven missed uh, victories for Lance Armstrong where they didn't promote the second place riders at first because they all knew that second and probably third were taking drugs as well. Uh, that's an admission by not promoting them up to the winner and second spot overall in the tour. So it, is, it makes a mockery of the whole thing. And of course, until they come out with a decision, and of course, they're dragging their heels because they're scared. They've got to be absolutely right because if they're not, they'll be sued out of sight by Chris Room's lawyers. And if you never ever wanted to be a professional cyclist, but rather an extreme weekend warrior, there's always the Freedom Challenge for you. Bruce Hughes is a man who won the Freedom Challenges to Willowmore and Craddock almost back to back, many, many continuous kilometers. We asked Bruce why the heck? Oh, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, it's kind of a bit of a, <clears throat> bit of a habit, a bit of an addiction, to be honest. Um, it's not... It's not not the first time I've, I've a bit of a habit of um, of these doing these ultra endurance events. So um, I'm on a on a bit of a, like a sabbatical from from full time work, and I'm just exploring some avenues with the with endurance riding. So I've come back now from from New Zealand, where I did a uh, three thousand kilometer race. Mm. Well, all kitted up now in our brand new In The Bunch range of cycle apparel comprising of several very exciting items. If you fancy any of these, go onto our website and look in our virtual store and tell us which of these you would like. But as always now, we cover the podium in the world of cycling. Bronze medal, third, one of the big three on the podium this week, all cycle events in third place, the Empress Palace Classic. In second, the Cape Town Cycle Dwarf 28 in which three people very sadly lost their lives. Deservedly, in the gold medal position, right on top of the podium, the Cape Epic, the world's biggest mountain bike race, and the base, Birka split, seemingly bringing lots of eyes into the fold of cycling. Now, if you've enjoyed the show as much as what we've done doing it, don't forget to subscribe, and certainly don't hesitate to comment. If you like the kit, tell us whether it's good, bad, or the other way. And in fact, don't forget to tap the bell. It's Johnny Koron Biafu Kutsia host the entire In The Bunch team saying, I'm off for a pedal. I hope to see you in the bunch.